Hey there folks, it's me the Tactical Brit, your home of Tactical Gaming, Postscriptum Squad and more. And today I'm here with a Postscriptum Beginner's Guide. I know a lot of you guys out there right now are playing the game for the first time after a free weekend, or perhaps picking it up for the first time in general, and today I wanted to give you a full rundown beginner's guide of everything that is Postscriptum. First and foremost, welcome. Postscriptum is a really great game. It's my favorite World War II shooter and has a wonderful community across numerous different countries with lots of great servers. So make sure to check out your local servers and whatnot. Those will provide you a great home for all of your gameplay in the future. Now in the description below and in the comment section are going to be timestamps so you can skip towards relevant parts. If you're a brand new player I recommend you watch all the video but if you're somebody who's perhaps coming back to Postscriptum and there's some things you do know and do understand feel free to skip into those timestamps in order to watch exactly what you want to see and the parts that you feel are relevant to you. We're going to be going over everything from key points, movement, the shooting system, classes, equipment, maps, objectives, and even terminology. So there's going to be lots of content in this video today, and it will probably be a little bit confusing at times, but pay attention, it's relatively straightforward to play Postscriptum, and I'm going to give you lots of tips that will most likely lead to great success in the game and enjoyment for you across the entire board. So let's dive on in. First off, let's start with some key points. Now, there are some things about Postscriptum that you should know before you get started. Number one, a mic is needed for Postscriptum. This game is all about communication and you should have a mic at all times. It doesn't matter if it's the most fancy thing in the world or if it sounds like something that's being dragged through glass and metal. Honestly, people don't really care. They just want to hear you communicate. At the end of the day, this is a team-based game and communication is the key to success. So make sure you have a microphone or look into investing in purchasing one. There are lots of cheap microphones around that are great. And honestly, most things in Postscriptum are done via comms, be that local chat or game chat. And this is pretty important. So you use local chat by pressing V and you use uh, squad chat by pressing B. Those are your two available chat keys. If you're a squad lead, which I don't recommend doing as a beginner until you've reached about 50 hours of gameplay, you can talk to other commanders by pressing G. Next up is always ask questions. Team play is essential in Postscriptum and you should be working with your squad and squad leaders relatively closely. Um, most keys to success in this game come from being a coordinated unit and working together in order to achieve objectives, so stick by your teammates and feel free to ask questions. If you're a new player, most people will most likely be happy to tell you the ropes or give you interesting information that will be useful to you. Also, I do highly recommend not using the squad lead role. Please don't do that. It's something that's very frustrating uh, for veteran players. When a new player is squad leading, definitely try it after you've got some hours in the game, but not right away because it's a very overwhelming task. And I highly recommend that new players get grounded in everything that they're doing in Postscriptum and feel like they know the ropes before they dive into this role. So that's about it for key points wrapped up. The only other thing I'd mention is that use the firing range. It's important that you try equipment, which is all available here on this rack, uh, including everything from explosives and everything in between and various different weapons. I say this is vitally important because essential roles like anti-tank, light mortar, and the pioneer kit are very important to success in postscriptum across various game modes. And anti-tank especially is something that you vitally need in order to fend off objectives and attack objectives as well. So please don't use those roles until you've come into the firing range and tried out all of that equipment. You know, learn how to use these rocket launchers, learn how to use TNT, mines, gammon bombs, which I will explain later in this video as well, but just make sure you've got a few hours with it or at least some time with it and an understanding of how it operates before you dive into using those roles. They are essential roles and needed for players to win the game. So make sure you leave that to an experienced player until you've got the hours you feel necessary to dive into that role. So, section two is movement. Today I'm gonna to tell you everything about the movement system in Postscriptum, which may sound a little bit simple, but it's actually quite a convoluted system and something that is very important to how you play in Postscriptum. Now, Postscriptum is a relatively straightforward game. It's much like other shooters. There is a crouching system, and there is a proning system. I recommend rebinding those to comfortable keys because you will be using them a lot. And it's worth noting that Postscriptum has a sprint functionality by pressing the shift key. And also you can crouch sprint and even a fast crawl when you use the sprint key. 
Now all of these, as you can see in the bottom right corner, by using sprinting is draining our stamina bar, which I'm going to explain the importance of. But also it's worth noting that there is a uh, lean system in Postscriptum that can be done in all three stances, standing, crouching, and prone. And the lean system is very important for getting behind serious points of cover and still being able to engage targets. So, let's talk about that stamina system. Stamina is incredibly important in Postscriptum. Now, stamina entirely determines how your gun handles. As you can see here, without focusing my weapon, I have a large amount of weapon sway. That iron sight is bouncing from side to side, and hitting a distant target like that guy over there seems virtually impossible with this level of weapon sway. Now, what you're going to see here is me draining my stamina, and for the purposes of this demonstration, I will speed up the gameplay just so you can see what it looks like. Now you can see in Postscriptum there is a fair amount of stamina, and I'm slowly depleting here into the orange level, which will eventually reach the red level. Now this stamina is incredibly important, and I'll explain why as I start to aim down the site on a very low amount of stamina. This is something that you should never do in Postscriptum, and something you should avoid at all costs if humanly possible. My stamina is about to be depleted, and look at the functionality I am left with once I have depleted stamina. Now. My gun is incredibly heavily swayed, but I also can't press the shift key, which is the run and focus key, so I can't focus my sights, which steadies the weapon sway. That means if I get into an engagement, I have to wait for that stamina bar to go from zero to orange again in order for me to get this shift functionality back. And that focus functionality is the only way you're going to hit distant targets and the only way you're going to be effective. So make sure your stamina is relatively stocked up. You can do this in two ways. Number one, staying still regains stamina at a faster rate than moving. You can see as I walk around here, it takes a little while longer, but if I stop and stay still, it goes up much quicker. Crouching and proning also increases the rate of recovery of stamina, but the most effective way of getting stamina back is using your canteen, which is a piece of equipment that everybody has in Postscriptum. The canteen is very effective, you just have to take a swig of it, you get lots of swigs in a canteen, and you can see how very quickly that restores my stamina bar. I highly recommend this for if you're running into an engagement. Most people and most situations in Postscriptum will require you to run over a big open field like this, or through these woods or something, and then start shooting shooting at people. So it's a lot of stamina, it's very demanding, and I always recommend taking a canteen swig before you get into a long combat situation, because it will likely save you in a lot of scenarios that you didn't expect it to save you in. Finally, I think it's worth mentioning that Weapon Swain is also entirely controlled by your prone and stance system in general. So you can see here I have a lot of Weapon Sway making it hard to hit targets without focusing my sights. However, I can counteract that by crouching, and you can see that it's been dramatically reduced there, and I could probably hit that target. And if I prone, there's effectively little to no scope sway. And at that point, it's basically just your own aim. So the crouch and prone system are pretty good, should I say crouch and prone system, are pretty good at reducing weapon sway, but also if you combine it with the focus setting, you effectively have pinpoint accuracy over range which is definitely something you want to have. That's about it for the movement system. There's not much else really. The only thing I can think of is how to vault. Uh, vaulting is pretty straightforward in this game. Anything that looks like it's at eye level can be vaulted onto. So for example, this tent is just above me, but it's at eye level, so I can vault up to it. The same thing applies with small things like sandbags and walls. As long as they are not over your head, you can probably vault them. Now it's worth noting as well that there is a sort of hardcore parkour system in Postscriptum that can actually be very useful for getting on rooftops and things like that. You can jump on top of various things uh, by reaching eye level and then using that hardcore parkour system to just sort of bounce around things. You can see what I'm doing here. It allows me to sort of jump between various different things, get up into height advantage situations and places that are useful. Now, you can also use this to save you from falling damage. In Postscriptum, anything from about a two-story height or second-story window like that up there will result in falling damage. So if you jump towards something, you can use that eye level height to pull yourself back up like that there, and that will stop you from taking damage and you can see that it will reduce the impact if there's a lower wall as well i could do the same it's also worth mentioning that you can use things like rocks and other high defilades and dips like these here if you're jumping from a height in order to reduce falling damage that's about it for the postscriptum movement system guys if you have any questions ask below
One thing I should definitely mention as well is that there is a free look system in Postscriptum. By pressing the Alt key, you can look around as much as you possibly want, up to 180 degrees, and that can be done even whilst moving, making it very effective for looking around to make sure you're safe whilst running across open distances. Next is the shooting system in Postscriptum, and Postscriptum actually has uh, probably a pretty advanced ballistic system as far as most shooters go. Now, I've mentioned already that there are sway, stances, and stamina effectors shooting, but there's also a cycling system and ballistic system that you do need to know about in this game. Now, for your information, in terms of damage, of weapon damage, Postscriptum is a highly lethal game. A bolt-action rifle like a Lee Enfield here, a Car 98, a Lebel rifle, or any of the basic standard issue rifles like the M1 Grant and Springfield will normally in most scenarios result in a one-shot, one kill. Up until around about 150 meters, I'd say. After that, there is bullet damage and bullet drop-off, and that can cause your damage to be a little less heavy and stop you from taking out targets. But even then, I'd say in most scenarios, bolt-action rifles are the most lethal weapon on the field in terms of damage over range. SMGs will require multiple bullets, which I will show you later. LMGs are mostly similar to bolt-action rifles, but over range do require more than one bullet and sniper rifles are effectively standard issue rifles with a scope on top of them, so they have the same kind of damage. Now, what you should know about postscriptum shooting is that there is a cycling system with bolt action rifles. Now, most players, unless you're using a specific class that has an SMG, LMG, assault rifle, or MG, or any of these semi-automatic rifles, will require you to cycle your weapon. Now, you'll show, I'll show you what this does, basically. Number one, fire by clicking the left button. Number two, cycle your weapon before you can fire again by clicking the same shoot button. And then you can fire again. The number of times I see new players get stuck into situations where they haven't cycled their weapon and they miss that critical shot is pretty bad. And it's something you should know about because postscriptum is decided on your accuracy in most gun battle engagements, I'd say. And the person who misses the shot is the person who loses in that specific situation. That tends to be how I find this game running out. And yeah, you want to be as accurate as possible. You don't want to miss any opportunities. So make sure you cycle your weapon. Now let's talk about ballistics and let's talk about weapon handling and stuff like that. Now, we know that these are various different ranges and we know that there is damage drop off in this game, but I'd say this bolt action rifle is probably fine up until around that 200 meter range. And we know that crouching and proning reduces weapon sway as does the focus system, allowing you to be as accurate as possible. Now, the only two things you do need to know are leading your shots and also zeroing. So if you aim down sight and hold the X key, most weapons like LMGs, basic rifles, sniper rifles, semi-auto rifles, and basically anything that isn't an SMG will give you a zeroing option. Holding X allows you to use your scroll wheel to change the zeroing. Some guns will have a small animation and other guns like this Lee Enfield will have a pop-up sight and that will get you a zeroing marker. So you can see at 100 meters here, I'm standing 200 meters away from those very, very distant targets all the way over there in the distance there. And they are pretty damn far away. 200 meters is a, a fair amount of distance to cover. So let's see if we can make that shot. Now, if I aim central mass with 100 meters zeroing, I'll likely hit the target in the leg, as you'll see here. So that target did still go down, but it wasn't a central mass shot, and ultimately the damage model in this game would probably mean that that will not result in a kill. Now if I change this by putting my iron sight onto 200 meters on zeroing, that little tiny nib in the middle of the iron sight is where the bullet will go. Now that it's zero to 200 meters, it will hit that 200 meter target, no problem, central mass, and that will most likely result in a kill. Now, the best way to notice where to zero your weapon is to look for specific landmarks. You can see here on your map, at the bottom right corner, there is an entire ranging system. One entire grid square is 300 meters, or a three block radius. So you can see here, there is a one, two, three blocks within the entire vicinity of this firing range here, and the very end of it is about 300 meters long. So that means the targets are somewhere between 200 and 300 meters, and you can fire your ranging between 300 and 200 meters in order to see if you can make that shot. Sniper rifles will probably give you the best example of how ranging works, and they are incredibly important, and zeroing is incredibly important in those. And you can see here, this target is probably 200 meters away, 
And if I fire central mass at 300, it might hit him, but there's a good chance it will probably go over his head as well. Just like it did there, it hit the hilltop behind. So that's something you want to be aware of and something that I find is very important. Next is leading your shots. Leading your shots in postscriptum is pretty simplistic. If somebody is running or moving around like these fast dolls, you want to aim slightly in front of them. Now I'd say up until around 150 meters, you don't need to lead your shots too much, as you can see here. Aiming central mass more or less does the job here. You just sort of have to hit the target as they move in central body mass areas. You don't really have to lead very much. But distant targets, you will have to lead ever so slightly. I'd say past 150 meters, you're looking at maybe half a soldier in front, and 200 meters onwards, you're looking at a soldier or more in front. Leading your shots is something you simply just have to learn in this game, and if you finally get to use the sniper rifle class, I highly recommend that you use the leading shot mechanic as best to your ability. Watch your bullets travel, look for your tracers, and you can see how much more or less you need to lead your shot in order to hit your targets. One last thing I think is worth mentioning when it comes to handling and weapon handling is that the guns in general have fire from the actual barrel themselves. This isn't like other FPS games where the bullets effectively come out your eyes. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Let's say I'm skipping along enjoying my fine World War II day and suddenly there's a guy to my right. You can hip fire them relatively simplistically here because the bullet comes out the end of the barrel. So if you can see the end of the barrel, that's where the bullet's coming out of. And it makes hip firing actually relatively easy and something you can use. Now, even though I did just hit that over range, I do not recommend hip firing over range. But if you do need to suppress a target, and bearing in mind, Postscriptum actually has a pretty advanced suppression system that does cause a lot of blur and a lot of distortion, even though these shots might not all necessarily hit, I can actually suppress the target pretty well because the bullets are landing near them. And that means that with a close shot, I can suppress the target and carry on on my merry way, knowing that he won't be able to hit a shot on me because he's been suppressed. Now, I will show you an illustration of suppression in this video right here. Uh, suppression in this game is very, very intense. It, it makes it very difficult to land your shots. So if you are using a semi-automatic or automatic weapon, I highly recommend suppressing your targets at all available possibilities because man, does it do the trick. So before we get this final section over, and I am going to be showing you the classes and all their equipment left over in the next section, I do want to give you a brief mention as to how some weapons work in terms of handling, because I feel as though it's important for this section. So this is an SMG. SMGs are automatic, low recoil, and they do the job at close to medium range. As you can see, I've just hit fired the hell out of that bad boy, but it's pretty accurate if you aim down sight too. They don't have a lot of recoil, they do the job, and they're great at suppressing enemies. However, if you want to hit a distant target and something that's far away, you don't get a lot of luck with SMGs. They mostly splash the ground next to it, but if you're like me and you're a seasoned player and you've played this for a while, you'll know it's just a simple case of aiming slightly higher. And you can see those targets were either suppressed or hit and went down. Now that doesn't guarantee a kill, I'd say most SMGs are two to four bullet kills in postscriptum depending on how close you are to them. Uh, so just be aware of that. They're, of course that will vary on player to player health, but I'd say two to four bullets is a healthy number and make sure you always finish off your target. I also should mention as well that headshots in postscriptum are always lethal. So if you're using an SMG, aim for the doink and you'll get a headshot. Also, headshots mean that players can't be revived, so they are typically more valuable. So if you see a guy just laying in a bush next to you, headshot them instead of body shots because that means that they can't be revived. Next up, let's talk about an LMG. Now, there are two variants of LMGs. There are heavy MGs like the MG42, and the reason this is called a heavy MG is because, well, this is what happens when you hip fire it. I basically did a 360 there. So, in order to use an MG, you have to walk up to any sandbag or lay down or anything that you can mount a weapon on, really, and press the C key, and that will mount your MG. As you can see, it's a pretty devastating weapon, and you can use the big burp burp to take down loads of people on Utah Beach. It's highly recommended that you do that. There are slightly smaller LMGs in the game, such as the FG-42, and I think we have the MG-26 here. 
These have much less recoil. The Bren gun is probably a good example of this, as is the bar. They're light LMG variants, and they do have some recoil, but can be controlled. You don't necessarily have to mount these weapons, but if you want to get the best out of them, I highly recommend you do. Now, all automatic weapons in this game do feature the ability to go semi-auto, or at least most of them do. Clicking into your middle mouse scroll wheel will allow you to do that. And if you haven't gotten your weapon mounted and you want to hit something at range, going into the semi-auto mode is never a bad idea, unless you want to burst fire your gun. So that's about it really, sniper rifles that just have a big scope on it, you'll see that in the next section, SMGs, light machine guns, heavy machine guns, semi-auto rifles fire like bolt actions but faster, that's pretty straightforward. The only thing I guess I should show you is the anti-tank rifle. This is an anti-tank rifle, it is the primary weapon of any anti-tank class, and well, it's just pure devastation. This is the boys AT rifle, especially here, you can see these things are 0 to 300 meters. And, uh, yeah. It's pretty devastating. These will actually explode an enemy player on impact, meaning that they can't be revived. But these are intended for vehicles. This isn't a primary weapon meant for people. It's meant to disable or destroy vehicles using their tracks or weak engine points. Other than that, that's about it. I want to show you guys next up in equipment and classes everything else that you'll need to know such as grenades and basic equipment so let's dive on to that this is equipment and other basic universal equipment in this i'm going to show you the equipment that each individual class receives and i'm also going to explain some universal equipment that everybody receives in the game step one is universal equipment now most people in the game will receive some kind of standard issue rifle there are various types of these the car 98 the label rifle the maz 36 uh, the M1 Grand is probably my favorite, and the Springfield as well. Now, you get a standard rifle like this, and it, it's pretty straightforward, you know, they do the job. But, you also get some other equipment. Some classes come equipped with a sidearm or a pistol, and these pistols are great to switch to when you get caught into close quarters situations and don't have the time to reload. You'll also come equipped with a grenade. Most, or at least I'd say most 90% of classes will have some kind of grenade with them, a lethal grenade and a smoke grenade. So, for example, this is a typical standard grenade here. Now you can left click to overarm a grenade. Or, more importantly, you can right click to underarm a grenade. Right clicking and underarming is great for rolling a grenade onto something like a rally point, which I'll explain later. Or, if you want to get it over a wall or into a little ditch, just roll it into the ditch. It's worth noting that these grenades and lethal grenades have a pretty big ballast radius, so don't roll it anywhere near you. And if you fail a grenade throw, for example, if you try to get it through a window and you bottle it, it bounces off the window, make sure you shout out in local comms a bad nade, so people know that there is a grenade next to them, and they need to get the hell out of there before you kill them. You can do the same with smoke grenades, overarm and underarm, but it's worth noting that smoke grenades need time to dissipate. There is only one kind of smoke grenade that's on the British faction, and sometimes the American faction, I believe, that explodes on impact. But for the most part, the rest of the grenades and smoke varieties of these grenades will need time to dissipate before you can use their functionality. You will also have a shovel in the game, or a pickaxe like this little boy here, and, well, these kind of just do a very simplistic thing. Uh, if you have a shovel and or pickaxe, which are what you get here, you can go up to an emplacement that's been put down by a uh, friendly, such as a sandbag, or if your squad leader and logistics core are working together, they'll put down like a bunker or something. They'll tell you it's there though, get your shovel out, walk up to it and left click. Left click will build it up, right click will build it down. Everybody comes equipped with a canteen, as I mentioned before, and again, that's just a simple case of taking a big old swig and getting your stamina back. Some classes will come equipped with binoculars, mostly the squad leaders and sniper classes, and this is good for spotting people at range without necessarily having to use your weapon. Or if you want to work as a spotter for another LMG or MMG, and that's pretty important too. Some classes will come equipped with other more lethal grenades, such as the Gammon Bomb. Uh, mostly the Pioneer class has this, and the Pioneer is an anti-equipment and anti-tank class. 
that explodes on impact and is pretty devastating. You also get a bandage and a morphine. So I will show you this in a separate clip because for some unknown reason you can't actually do this in the basic firing range. But you get a bandage and you right click to heal yourself. If you find your screen pulsating or if you see the color draining away from your screen, that is an indication that you need to bandage. And you left click to bandage someone else. If you see a friendly that's gone down and there is a gray name tag over the body, you can left click your morphine to bring them up. Now most classes only have one morphine pouch, uh, but other classes such as the medic will have multiple. Now you only get one morphine, so make sure you're using it on essential personnel, such as other medics who can get up more people or your squad lead if you need to place down an important spawn point. Now it's worth noting here as well that the morphine, it can only be applied once and it can't be applied to yourself, so don't try and heal yourself when you die. Believe it or not, I've had this question asked before. And I should note as well that much like this dummy here, if somebody's had their head blown off or they've been exploded, you cannot revive them. So if somebody gets headshot and you see the helmet fly off, or if you see them explode and their bodies and limbs are scattered around the place, well, they can't be revivable. So if I was to hit these dummies over here with a grenade, you aren't picking most of those guys up. And really, I think that's about it. There's no other real other piece of equipment that's worth mentioning. Uh, you have your shovel, you have your grenades, you have your smoke grenades. I should mention that smoke grenades are an incredibly important part of making pushes in this game, and you should use them at all times, especially if your squad leader asks you to do that. And that's about it for basic equipment on Universal. So everybody will have that rough level of equipment. Sometimes you won't have a pistol. Sometimes you won't have a certain type of grenade. But you'll always have a shovel. You'll always have a bandage. Some people will come with sandbags as well that they can place down. Uh, but ultimately, you get relatively basic standard equipment across the board. And that's what everybody can use. Now, let's talk about individual weapon classes. The first one, and probably my favorite one, is the Pioneer class. So they come equipped with an SMG, which is usually this, a grease gun, or one of the uh, French SMGs over here, or French rifles. But ultimately, you're a fast kind of hit the, hit the equipment kind of guy. You have an SMG to do close quarters damage, which is pretty important, but you also come equipped with an array of equipment. For example, a satchel TNT charge, which is great for destroying enemy emplacements or enemy equipment such as AEA guns, which you quite literally just left click and throw on the ground. Once that's on the ground, run, 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 get into some cover because that thing explodes. Equipment such as the TNT charge, gammon bombs, and even TNT just like this are vitally important for taking out equipment such as AE-8 cannons, bunkers emplacements and weapon emplacements like this MG placement here. So you just walk up to them, drop the TNT or drop the charge, you'll see sometimes a little green outline like this to place it and you run like hell because those things blow up and they do a lot of damage. Another piece of equipment worth mentioning is the Hawks Mine. Now there are German variants of this as well. Uh, I believe the German variant of this has um, one of the mines over here available. And these are magnetic mines. You'll see a magnetic symbol over this mine when you equip it. Uh, and these mines need to be placed on equipment and or vehicles for them to actually do any damage. So if you walk up to a vehicle or an emplacement like this cannon here, you'll be able to see a little green marker. Pop that down. Get into a little bit of cover because you don't want to blow up. And boom. Now, naturally, this thing is uh, currently invulnerable. But if that was a regular anti-tank cannon, that thing would be completely destroyed. So pioneers are super important for taking out necessary pieces of equipment. Don't waste your explosives on infantry because it's simply not worth it. Pioneers do come with grenades as well. So make sure you're using them effectively. Some of them will also come with road mines like this one although it's not typically common as far as I'm aware, and this is normally with the logistics class, and these can be placed down like this to take out various types of vehicles. I won't do that now because there's a good chance that I will step on said mine and blow myself up. The next up is the anti-tank class. Now the anti-tank class typically comes with one of these big bad boy mines, which can be placed down in order to take out tanks that are coming down roads, but most typically they will come with some kind of rocket launcher or bazooka. So this is the Panzerfaust and Panzer Shrek here. They are a light and heavy variant of anti-tank, and you can see that you aim down sight with these boys, you zero them, and you try and hit tanks that are in the distance. I think that's probably around 100 meters away, so I'm going to aim a little bit above it. 
Well, I was a little bit over that time, and this is why the anti-tactics work, because I've been playing squad and postscriptum for years, and even I find these things difficult to hit sometimes. That was a much more direct hit. Now, in terms of using stuff like the anti-tank mines and uh, the anti-tank rifles and weapons in general, such as this uh, Panzerfaust and such as the Bazooka and such as the Hawks mine, uh, you always want to be aiming for weak points on the tank, and typical weak points tend to be the tracks and the rear of the tank, which is where the engine is. You also have the Piat launcher here, which is the same same principle really, although the Piat can actually do a lot of damage against infantry as well, though I do highly recommend this is entirely kept for tanks. If I step back here. A little bit short there, I figured that would probably go a little bit further, and this is why using the firing range is important, because you take time to learn these things. That's a direct hit. Now that would do some damage to the tank. It hit the side of it, which isn't necessarily a weak point, but the front is the strongest point of the tank, so make sure you avoid that at all costs. And finally, over here, there should be a big bad boy bazooka sitting around for me to use as well. Um, and just in general, there are, there are various kinds of anti-tank weapons, such as the anti-tank rifles, uh, but the AT class typically comes with one launcher and maybe a gammon bomb or something or some kind of mine, and that will be it. Moving on, we have the Grenadier class. Now, the Grenadier class comes with an array of stuff here. So, for example, in the American faction, the Grenadier class has a grenade launcher grenade, an anti-tank grenade, and a smoke grenade. So, if I pick up the anti-personnel grenade, it's a relatively straightforward task. They pop it on the end of the rifle, as they did in World War II, pop a round in to chamber, and you just doink it at people. So, 50 meters, that's probably 50. And boom, instant impact, instant destruction, takes out multiple infantry. A very lethal thing to use, and there are also uh, anti-tank variants which are important, so of course you can use this on vehicles. Typically I'd say these are weaker, so aim for the tracks of vehicles and aim for uh, the backside of vehicles if you really want to do any damage with this thing. But again, these are all things that are pretty important, so that's about 100 meters away I'd say. Oh, I went slightly over that time. And again, these things are things you learn, much like the... Um, anti-tank uh, Panzerfaust and the Bazooka. These are things that you need to try in the range before you use them. A great thing about the anti-tank and anti-smoke is that they are explosion on impact, so is the grenade, so you can do stuff like this. And that will provide great cover for your teammates in order to make a push. So that's about it for the Grenadier class. They get all of those fancy rifle grenades, which everybody loves to use. Next up, let's have a look at the sniper rifle class. Now, the sniper rifles in this game are, well, pretty straightforward. It's normally a standard issue rifle with a scope, and you get a pair of binoculars. So here is a Springfield. And here you can see the real importance of zeroing your weapon to the correct range. So you can see that was a little bit too high. If I put this to 400, it goes straight over that target. That target's somewhere between 200 and 300, I'd say. So I'm going to aim 200 and aim high. And that was a central mass shot right there. If I aim 300 and aim low, that's a central mass shot again. So sniper rifles, incredibly lethal over range. Learn to zero your weapon and lead your shots and you'll be incredibly effective. They do often come with a sidearm as well, which is very important for close quarters situations. Next, we have light and heavy machine guns, the MG34 and 42 being the best examples. And well, we've already seen these weapons, they're straightforward. You mount them pressing C, and you just cause flat out devastation. These are great for suppressing opponents and causing problems for people trying to reach objectives. And there are also light variants. My favorite at the moment is the FG42, which is in the most recent update. And these are the light variants that have smaller magazines. The US, of course, has the BAR. Next is the Radio Man. The Radio Man often comes with a carbine rifle, such as the M1A1 or a G41 or G43, or in the case of the French, a Maz 36. Now, these are semi-auto rifles, or for example, if you happen to be a Radio Man, you get an M1A1 like this, you get the rifle that's with a bit more power. Now, carbines tend to be a tiny bit weaker and a bit more inaccurate, so you have to take these time with these weapons sometimes. 
but you do get that great chance of suppression with a semi or rifle and a radio man's job is simply to stick close to their squad lead a radio man will allow the squad lead to place new rally points which are spawn points and refresh those rally points as they have timers which are incredibly important to make sure you maintain Next up is the Medic class. The Medic class comes with a standard issue rifle, extra bandages in order to heal other people and themselves, and a, a large array of morphine in order to heal other people as well, or just general syringes. Worth knowing about this is it takes one bandage to heal somebody and stop them bleeding out, and a second bandage to heal them to full strength. Finally, we have one of the light mortar classes. Light mortars come with uh, just a basic standard issue rifle and the ability to use a light mortar. So in order to use a light mortar, you lay down, press C, and you'll be able to use a two inch mortar. And this typically allows you to use smoke grenades and heavy explosive grenades. Now, in order to use the mortar, you use your uh, mouse and then you basically pretty straightforwardly mount it and push your mouse forwards in order to get more range uh, and backwards to get less range and somewhere in between the two will be sort of a sweet spot of the longest distance you can hit with a mortar so if i put this at 60 and fire a couple rounds you can see that does some pretty major devastation on the field you can also use this for smoke rounds, which will allow you to prevent enemy pushes or cut off sight lines, which is quite important in general, I'd say, and uh, something definitely worth using. Finally, we have the squad lead role, and the squad lead typically comes with an SMG such as this MP34. An STG assault rifle or an M1A1 Thompson. They typically get slightly more advanced weapons than anybody else, but the reason for that is because they have a harder task and often have to deal with difficult situations and listen and coordinate with other teams. I don't recommend using the squad lead until you've got a good number of hours in this, so don't really worry about this class until later on. And that's about it for classes. We have anti tank, we have the pioneer, we've got the mortar, we've got the medic, we've got the sniper rifle, we've got the MGs, we've got the basic infantryman, and well, that's more or less it i should note as well that basic infantrymen the people that use the standard issue rifles and don't really have much else uh, also have the ability to drop ammo boxes which is pretty important for the rest of the team finally let's talk about the map objectives and general terminology so the map is your most important asset in this game it allows you to understand where objectives are and how far away they are in this basic training field you can see a grid square a b and half of c and one two three now your map is great for calling out contacts. For example, if I want to call out an enemy location where I see a squad or if I see a spawn, I would say something like, hey squad lead, there is somebody in B2, key one, sub key three. So what that exactly means is that if you look at the number pad key on your keyboard, this is a number pad key. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And within those individual squares are is another set of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So for example, if I wanted to call out this objective here, A1, that would be B because we're in the B section across, two because we're in two down, sub key three, sub key one, because it's here in the first section of this third key. And that's how you call out contacts. The bottom right also explains the ranging. So one entire block is 300 meters. Uh, an individual block is 100 meters. So that's great for ranging your targets and looking for landmarks. It also tells you what is available on the map. So for example, this is a forward operating base or a spawn, which can be spawned on when yellow. This is a deployment point for new objectives. And these flags here, the grayed out ones can't be captured and the colored ones can be captured. You also have other things such as uh, armors here, like some armored vehicles, transport vehicles, transport vehicles, tanks, and logistics. So effectively, you don't really need to know a lot of these and you will learn to see them over time. But the most things you should be focused on are here are your objectives here that you need to be worried about. These are the things you need to focus on. And if they have a timer on them, it means they'll be able to be captured soon. If they don't have a timer on them, you won't be able to capture them. Or if they're grayed out, you won't be able to capture them. There are three kinds of modes you need to know about in Postscriptum. There is invasion, which is effectively an attack defend. There is random area assault and area assault, and there is the basic offensive. So offensive is effectively like front lines from battlefield. One team attacks, the others defend, and once the attackers capture a flag, it can't be attacked or defended by the defenders anymore. They have to fall back to the next objective. 
The same thing applies in Invasion. In Invasion, the invaders have to take out objectives, and if they do that job, the attackers have done their job, and the defenders will have to fall back to the next set of defensive objectives. These will be objectives either marked by a red X as a destroy marker which needs to be defended, or as a flag that needs to be captured. Finally, there is Area Assault and Random Area Assault. These are flags that appear on the map like the ones you can see here. They'll be colored in and effectively you have to capture those flags and each flag you capture unlocks a next flag and that flag will be capturable once you've captured the one before it. So it's a bit like the chain link mode from Battlefield. If you capture one flag, so if I capture, I don't know, Alpha flag, I can then capture Beta flag and if I capture Beta flag, I can capture Charlie flag. And these are backwards and forwards. They can be attacked and defended by either faction and don't have a fixed system like invasion or offensive. Finally, there is basic terminology. So, for example, uh, we have the callouts like I mentioned, keypad 1, subkey 1, for example, or B2, B3, A1, A2, and the map grid sections continue. You should know that an enemy FOB is the big old base that you can see there with a tent, and that is a spawn point. A rally point is a tiny, tiny little... Uh, uh, kind of like a, a little tent it's like one of these but downscaled and you have to take on a rally point uh, in order to destroy them like this little rally point here these are rally points and reap group points the german ones are in green the allied ones are brown and if you're on the allied team you're going to want to blow up those and if you're on the german team you're going to want to blow up those with a simple frag grenade that you just roll onto them and they will explode and destroy in this example they won't because obviously i'm in the training range but in all examples they will blow up Finally, there is an MSP or mobile spawn point. These are typically trucks like these. Don't get them confused with logistics trucks. Now, mobile spawn points have nobody in the back of them. They have nothing in the back of them, whereas a logistics truck often has supplies like you can see over there. You have to destroy mobile spawn points, FOBs, and rally points in order to reduce the number of enemies that are coming to the general objective. And those are pretty important. Other than that, there are positions of interest or POIs. Uh, these are marked with blue numbers on the map and those numbers are important because it marks either a potential enemy spawn or something you should be worried about like an enemy tank. So listen and communicate with your squad lead and he will tell you everything going on. And if you have any questions regarding communication, be sure to ask them because I guarantee you they will answer and do everything you need. In terms of armor, I'm not going to do a vehicle section for this because I don't feel beginning players should use vehicles. Um, there is basic armaments like this and trucks and transport trucks that you can use, drive around in. You press E to start and you use WASD to turn and slow down and whatnot. And there are basic transport vehicles like this um, that you can use across the map. There is the command vehicle, lodges, and other things like that. But if you want to learn how to use tanks, do that in this range here. Don't use tanks straight away and take your time to learn it. That's about it for this video today, folks. It's been me, the Tactical Brit. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me, and I'll catch you again in another video.